Good afternoon and welcome back. Thank you all for hanging with us for our, our next round about reviewing our 2021 Advocacy Days federal agenda. And as you just heard from some of our state legislators, um, the focus is on um, heavy on our appropriations asks right now because March is appropriation season and people are starting to set the budget. So with us, I'd like to welcome Edward Long, um, Edward Long is the Vice President of Vance Filioque Associates and is also the MRF lobbyist. Dr. Long practice focuses on biomedical research, academic health centers, including freestanding cancer centers, public health, wellness, and disability policy. Prior to joining the private sector, Ed served as staff director of the Senate Labor, Health and Human Services Appropriations Subcommittee, where he focused on funding for the National Institutes of Health and, Can and Center for Disease Control and Prevention. As legislative director for Senator Tom Harkin, who is a Democrat from Iowa, he was instrumental in the creation of the Department of Defense Breast Cancer Research Center. Um, and I am going to uh, introduce and have Ed join us now, and I will also start sharing the screen so he can um, begin his presentation. Ed? Cassie, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. And everybody else, well, let's see. Uh, I would also add that in addition to all the above, uh, I myself uh, was diagnosed with the in situ melanoma in 1996. Um, fortunately, it was discovered early, so I'm a big uh, fan of research, but also of screening, uh, and I admire, and I also uh, very much appreciate all of you attending. Um, this is, we are in a different world, a virtual world now, uh, but also for the time that you're going to be spending this week on advocating uh, for our federal agenda. Uh, and I also want to commend Kylie and particularly Cassie for uh, all of her work in organizing this, and more importantly, for her tolerance of all of my tech-related questions. Um, so I thank you. So uh, Cassie, can we uh, move to the next slide, please? Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the federal agenda, issues <clears throat> that we would like you folks to advocate for in your time, your 30, 25 minutes or so with your Congress people, and in one case, your member of, of the Senate. Um, and you also have leave behinds associated with all of these uh, requests, and they are going to be, they have already been emailed out to staff with whom you're meeting. So you can, you know, use these as cheat sheets as well. So in terms of our agenda, number one, as Donna Kimbark um, uh, elaborated on earlier in a great presentation, funding uh, in the fiscal 2022 defense appropriations bill for defense funded melanoma research. We are asking for fiscal 22, $40 million for the melanoma research program or MRP. Uh, this is a $10 million increase over what we achieved or acquired, what Congress appropriated for us in fiscal 2021, uh, which was a bill that was passed and signed into law on December 27th of next year. Um, and what we, you're asked specifically, if you're talking to one of your representatives that is a member of the House, ask them to sign on to a letter being circulated by Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney of New York. She'll be speaking to you all on Wednesday. And also staff, and Cassie, I'm going to ask that, that you should ask the staff to contact, if they're interested in signing on to this letter, Carolyn Maloney's a pro, a staffer, uh, Danielle Summer, Sumner at, uh, at danielle.sumner at mail.house.gov. Cassie, if you want to send that out uh, to them. Um, Number two, in terms of uh, funding for the Nas and National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute specifically, we're asking for a $3.2 billion overall increase for NIH for fiscal 22. Within that, a $7.6 billion total funding for the National Cancer Institute. And uh, melanoma-specific 
report language under the um, NCI or National Cancer Institute section of the fiscal 2022 labor, health, human services, uh, and education appropriations bill. Uh, the third big item is skin cancer prevention. Uh, asking for $5 million for the skin cancer prevention activities of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That $5 million represents a $1 million increase over the 21 level for this program. And this funding level is in the fiscal 2022 Labor, Health, Human Services Appropriations Bill. I will get into a little bit more detail as I go. And last, Request that the Food and Drug Administration's proposed rule on prohibiting minors from using tanning, tanning beds. Ask your members to write the Food and Drug Administration to make this, this proposed rule a final rule. Um, and this would essentially ban the use of tanning beds by minors under 18. So all the activities you've been doing on the state level would essentially, the bottom line, the, the minimum standard would be set on the federal level, uh, and I know there, uh, so this would actually be a massive shift, paradigm shift in the term of how we regulate uh, uh, tanning beds, this time on a federal level. So let me go to the next agenda, the fiscal uh, 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 DOD funded melanoma research. <clears throat> Just so you know, a couple of things. Congress is, we are in the process, Congress is in the process of beginning consideration of its fiscal 2022 appropriations bills. You would say, well, wait, we're in calendar 21. The reality is they fund going forward. The fiscal 22 starts in October 1st of 21, extends till September 30th, 22. So the appropriations bills that are, will be considered that you're gonna be asking members and their staff to put money in are the fiscal 22 bills. Um, a little bit of why, why were we asking for a $10 million increase? Um, one of the things we've discovered and Donna Kimbark has said, there are significant numbers of excellent grants and projects that have applied for defense money that have not been able to be funded because of limited resources. Uh, so in other words, actually, we, we did a calculation. We could actually increase this program to $60 million and be in order to fund all excellent and outstanding grants that in, a, in an ideal world would be funded. Um, the, um, um, so we actually can sustain it on a numbers basis and on a policy basis. As Donna basically said, in terms of the numbers, there really is a war fighting and a health for the war fighter component justification to this program. In terms of the, uh, you know, the, the young people who are uh, war fighters nowadays, people are like under 24, the fact that they've been fighting in areas such as uh, Iraq, uh, which is obviously a desert climate, which is very hot, or in Afghanistan, which because of high UV, because of the of the um, uh, altitude, uh, we we're, we're probably going to see 20 years or 30 years from now significant numbers of uh, incidents of melanoma amongst our war fighters, uh, and also given that prevention, preventive methods such as using sunscreen is not something that has been taught to the warfighters. I included, and Cassie, I hope you included, in terms of your leave behind, a multiple page backgrounder uh, giving these justifications and outlining the justification for our $40 million request. Again, this program is competitive, subject to uh, peer, rigorous peer review, and it and as they make sure that it's not duplicative of what is done in terms of melanoma by the National Cancer Institute. Uh, this program is very responsive to the needs of the community, and as Donna's also said, 
focus on creating new and innovative ways of preventing melanoma uh, amongst warfighters and their families. So uh, this is money that's very, very dear uh, to us. Okay, next, uh, Betty, the next one here, this is the letter to Betty McCollum, who, who is chair of the House Appropriations Defense Subcommittee and ranking member Ken Calvert, Republican of California. He is the ranking Republican on defense appropriations. This is the subcommittee that sets the number for uh, uh, appropriates dollars for defense, the entire DOD, uh, which is around $600 billion, and also includes separate line items for programs such as the Department of Defense funded melanoma research program. This is a letter that Carolyn Maloney will be circulating that if you're talking to a member of the House, you're, and we're asking uh, you to um, ask that staff person to contact Carolyn Maloney's staffer to sign on to this letter. If you're on the Senate, and uh, we do not have a Senate letter right now, but if you find a, one of your senators or senator staff who's willing to take the lead, they can use this text as a basis to do a Senate letter, but follow up with Cassie and me if you have any interest uh, by staff in that direction, because we'd love to have a Senate letter on that score. Okay, Cassie. Okay, the next area is research through the uh, National Institutes of Health and within that National Cancer Institute, which actually funds melanoma research. For overall for NIH, excuse me, we are asking for a $3.2 billion increase for NIH, which would bring a total level to about $46.1 billion. NIH funds all diseases, not just cancer, it's got heart, lung, and blood, it's a center, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, uh, even complementary medicine, and as a center uh, for uh, minority health, but it's, uh, and that the National Cancer Institute is where melanoma research is being funded. And for NCI, we're asking for a total funding level of 7.6 billion, which is the professional judgment budget uh, sent up by NCI about what they could do. What, if they, if they had the option to get all the money, this is the, this is the budget they'd like to have. Uh, also ask them to include Melanoma specific report language. Cassie, you might want to go to the next page. This is the melanoma specific report language that has been written up uh, by member, by scientists in our SAC, uh, coordinated by Dr. Allison Mark Martin. Uh, so this reflects, it's not an earmark, it only it's areas where we think and the research community thinks uh, NCI should focus its attention and its resources when dealing with melanoma. Uh, and last, we ask the uh, staff to support NIH's Office of Rare Diseases, as, as, as referenced in Adana's presentation, uvioma, uvioma melanoma, melanomas, ocular melanomas uh, are rare diseases as well. Uh, so we want to encourage support on the Hill uh, for the NIH's Office of Rare Diseases. Next slide. On the prevention side, uh, within the fiscal 22 Labor, Health, Human Services Appropriations Bill, which also funds NIH, uh, the, that bill also funds the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We obviously all know about CDC uh, from you know, reading about what's being done or you know, not being done or what has not been done on the case of COVID pandemic response, vaccine distribution, et cetera. But it also funds a very small line in, uh, in cancer prevention and control and specifically skin cancer prevention uh, and education. A modest amount of money. I don't know what the breakout is. One would have to do the math about what the five million translates to the several hundred million people in the United States. But look, these programs don't go to individuals. They go to state public health departments to do education campaigns uh, to better educate uh, to the community about the need for 
uh, skin cancer prevention. It partners with local governments, businesses, health education, community, nonprofit, and faith se sectors to leverage this money to educate people better about skin cancer prevention, staying out of the sun between one and four, wearing sunscreen, wearing a hat, things like that, um, things that to prevent incidences of skin cancer. Next slide, please. Okay, another issue, which is I know very, very important to skin cancer prevention, as well as um, melanoma advocacy is um, the issue of tanning beds and access to tanning beds. Uh, this has been an issue that I've been working on and MRF has been working on for a long time. Um, long story short, because uh, it's obviously, it's clear from the data points that uh, even one, one use of tanning beds uh, results in a higher incidence of skin cancer over time uh, just by the mere exposure to it. Um, we also know that uh, UV exposure, actually, if you can go on the next page, and then I'll go back, Cassie, if you don't mind. These are some of the talking points. 59% uh, increase the risk of melanoma in those who have been exposed to UV radiation from indoor tanning. The risk increases with each use. Um, you know, increased use of uh, squamous cells, 67%, basal cell, 29%. And particularly, the risk is greatest amongst individuals under 18. Uh, and, you know, and given that um, in, in you know, men's use tanning beds, but uh, women by a higher rate than men use tanning beds. So this, we actually would argue that this is really a women's health issue uh, uh, in terms of melanoma and exposure to UV radiation through the use of tanning beds. You can go back to that previous slide, Cassie, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, so what are we asking for? Um, Prior uh, to the uh, recent administration of uh, President Trump, uh, the Obama administration's FDA had had a proposed rule, and this is basically uh, not a st it's not statutory, but it's enforceable to ban the use of um, tanning beds uh, to minors under 18. This did not apply to folks who are using or tanning uh, UV lights for skin disorder like psoriasis under a doctor's supervision. It only require it only applies to uh, tanning beds for commercial use. Uh, this led, this proposed rule would essentially ban, with a reporting requirement and enforcement mechanism. Uh, the use of tanning beds by minors under 18. I don't have the exact numbers in, in front of me, Cassie, you probably do. You know, a lot of effort has been undertaken in terms of banning use of tanning beds uh, on a state level. What this legislation, what this proposed rule would do, once if implemented and made final, would essentially become the basis, the base for all federal for all states of use of tanning beds. So in other words, in one fell swoop, if we can get this proposed rule, which is still sitting on the docket of the Food and Drug Administration, uh, if we can get that off the docket and make it final, it's still going to be subject to a review and comment, then, then we have a new baseline for prohibiting the use of tanning beds by minors. This would be a very significant move. Obviously, with the previous administration, we felt we weren't going to get that friendly a reception. Uh, we now, with Democrats controlling the House and Senate, and we have a, uh, uh, a Democratic uh, president, and we will have a Democratic Department of Health and Human Services, uh, we'll be, we feel like we have a much more favorable climate, a favorable viewpoint on banning the use of, of, of tanning beds. I'm not going to be naive. I, I presume 
once we get this done, uh, the tanning bed industry will uh, raise a significant problem, but we have to be prepared for it. You've all, those of you who fought this on a state level, have done an excellent job. We just have to translate that to a federal activity. And again, Carolyn Maloney has been very helpful. Her staff uh, is in the process of contacting the Department of Health and Human Services, asking them to weigh in. We, we are asking you to ask your representative and senator to write the Food and Drug Administration, asking them to take this proposed rule and make it final. Next slide. Actually, Cassie, if we can go to the House Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, going forward, not backwards. Thank you. Okay, uh, I know you're all going to be going on the Hill, uh, but I want to highlight you uh, some of the key members and are associated with the key committees on the appropriations uh, that play an important role. Now, let me just tell you, when you're going on the Hill, you're going to be asking some members to sign on to the Maloney letter. Uh, generally speaking, if you're talking to one of your representative or senator who is on the appropriations committee, they'll say, well, we don't sign on to letters. You know, that'd be like signing on to a letter to myself. In that event, we ask them, uh, the staff, to contact the chair or ranking member of the key subcommittees and weighing in in support of, in the case of defense, the, the $40 million for melanoma research program, in the case of labor, health, human services, appropriations, funding for NCI, NIH, and the melanoma report language, and uh, for CDC, the skin cancer. Five million for skin cancer prevention and education. Um, if you have any questions or need to follow up, uh, talk to Cassie, email me. Uh, also, if staff need assistance in terms of uh, all of these staff are going to have to fill out appropriations forms that be submitted to the Appropriations Committee, I will assist in writing up for those individual interested offices, should they be interested, let's hope they are, uh, filling out the appropriations form to give the justification. So a little bit of who, who these people are from. Betty McCollum is a new chair of Defense Appropriations. She is from Minnesota, Minneapolis, or I guess Minnesota. Uh, Tim Ryan, who's a Democrat from Ohio. Dutch Ruppersberger from Maryland. Uh, Marcy Kaptur from uh, uh, Northern Ohio, Henry Cuellar from Texas, Derek Kilmer from Washington State in the Seattle area, Pete Aguilar from California, Sherry Bustos is from downstate in Illinois, Charlie Crist is from Florida, the Tampa Bay region, and Ann Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick is from Arizona. These are all Democrats. On the Republican side, we have Ken Calvert from California. Uh, Hal Rogers is from Kentucky, Republican. Tom Cole, Oklahoma. Steve Womack is from Arkansas. Robert Adderholt is from Alabama. John Carter is from Texas. And Mario diaz Balart is from Florida, from the Miami area. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, on the Senate side, uh, these are the Senate members of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, so let me go through the Democratic members and then we'll go Republican. John Tester, Montana, the only organic farmer I know of in the United States Senate, just got elevated. He is chair of Defense Appropriations. Richard Durbin, Democrat of Illinois, Patrick Leahy, also chair of the full Senate Appropriations Committee of Vermont. Diane Feinstein, Democrat of California. Patty Murray, Washington State. Jack Reed from Rhode Island. Brian Schatz, Hawaii. Tammy Baldwin, Wisconsin. And Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire. 
On the R side is Richard Shelby of Alabama. He is also the ranking member of defense probes, but also the ranking member of the full Senate Appropriations Committee. Mitch McConnell, Kentucky, you've heard of this guy. Uh, he is the uh, Senate Minority Leader, previously Senate Majority Leader. Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Lindsey Graham, South Carolina, Roy Blunt of Missouri, Jerry Moran of Kansas, John Hoven of North Dakota, and John Bozeman of Arkansas. Next slide, please. The next key subcommittee is the Labor, Health, Human Services, Education, Appropriations Subcommittee on the House side. Uh, now let me go through the Democrats. Rosa DeLora of Connecticut, she is the chair. Uh, she's also chair of the full House Appropriations Committee. Lucille Roybal Allard of uh, California, the Los Angeles area. Barbara Lee of California, she's Northern California, represents the conservative city of Berkeley, uh, where I live. Mark Pocan of Wisconsin, he represents the University of Wisconsin area. Catherine Clark of Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. Lois Frankel of Florida. Cherry Bustos, as you can see, she's both on defense and labor age, Illinois. And Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey. On the R side, Tom Cole, ranking Republican. He's also on defense programs. Andy Harris of Maryland, he's in the Eastern Shore. Chuck Fleischman, new member, uh, had been before, but new, just recently brought back to the committee, subcommittee, Chuck Fleischman of Tennessee. Jamie Herrera Butler, uh, just out south of uh, Tacoma, Washington, uh, is Republican from Washington State. John Molinar of Michigan, and Ben Klein, a new subcommittee member, newly elected as well, uh, from Virginia. Uh, he represents that area right near where uh, uh, Virginia Tech is, uh, off of eight, Route 81. Next slide, please. No, not, not the last slide. Next one before that, Cassie. Thank you. Senate uh, Labor, Health, Human Services. This is the uh, Democratic Senate counterpart to the previous one in the House. Patty Murray of Washington State, uh, Richard Durbin of Illinois, Jack Reed of Rhode Island. He's also in defense probes, as is Durbin. Jeff Merkley of Oregon, Brian Schatz of Hawaii. He's also on defense probes. Uh, Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin, Chris Murphy of Connecticut, and Joe Manchin of West Virginia. On the R side, uh, ranking Republican is Roy Blunt of Missouri. Uh, Dick Shelby, Alabama, as you know, he's a ranking on defense approach. So anybody from Alabama, you have some uh, serious swag there. Lindsey Graham, also on uh, defense from South Carolina. Jerry Moran, I uh, see his name too, also on defense, Kansas. And I feel like I'm uh, uh, advertising for the, the offensive line and the Super Bowl. Uh, Shelley Moore uh, Capito, West Virginia. So you have two West Virginia members, one Dem, one D, one R on Labor HHS. John Kennedy, Republican of Louisiana. Cindy Hyde Smith of Mississippi. Mike Braun of Indiana. Marco Rubio of Florida. I think, um, and that's it for me. Um, uh, Cassie, do you want me to answer questions now or wait till after your, uh, uh, presentation. Hi, Ed. Thank you so much for asking. I think we should answer some of your questions now while it's fresh in everyone's mind. And then once we um, get through some of those questions, we can move on to um, what does it look like to have a congressional meeting and some of the do's and don'ts. Does that sound okay with you? You can. And uh, Nadia, right now, I see we do not know at this time. Uh, Cassie, you can probably provide to people, uh, and I'll send you the Maloney letter from last year and who signed on. Uh, uh, that'll answer who signed on to the letter last year, who we can target uh, again this year as well. 
Absolutely. Uh, and, and I'm just going to go through and read these questions for you just to make sure because we have some from up top, if that's okay. Um, we have a question from Michelle about how can we find out if our, oh, we already saw that Maloney's letter. I we already thought, asked about that. that. Um, the next one is, are there any 2020 research outcomes we can mention and impacts for other cancers other than immunotherapy stories? Anything related to mRNA, for example, like BioNTech melanoma research? Uh, we don't have that, but on that one that lead behind on the, uh, it should be in your um, lead behinds, there is, I believe. Okay, so specifically in the area of immunotherapy, the power of research in melanoma to advance the field of oncology. Um, that's in your, that's, everybody has that. And it's also been said is, uh, is in terms of the melanoma being an immunogenic cancer. Uh, and such melanoma is the best base to try and test new immunotherapies. And it links the impact of immunotherapy on other cancers, such as cervical cancer, colorectal, liver, kidney, lymphomas, et cetera. So specifically on the area of immunotherapy, uh, cancer research has been a breakthrough leading, leading the way. That's right. And if I'm, if I'm not um, mistaken, and these are up on our, these will be up on our action center a little bit later today, that, um, that uh, the breakthrough research in melanoma has been responsible for treatments affecting 15 other cancers, including cervical, um, and I believe a few colorectal cancers and small cell um, lung cancers, to name a few. Um, let's see, mm -hmm. Ed, this one is regarding um, the, the um, FDA's uh, proposed ruling in UV lamps. The question is from Geneva. Is there a way of adding the danger of even being exposed to the UV lamps when getting one's nails done? Um, and of course, it's important, it's an important form of education as we try to educate nail techs. But any thoughts on the devices uh, within FDA and nail lamp? Right now, that rule is on the docket. It's been vetted. We're not going to amend that rule. Uh, I don't know how it applies to nails. Um, I think um, that will be have to be revisited another day. We don't. It takes. It took so. It took on. Oh, Took over five years to get that rule from the early stages of FDA. We're not going to revise it right now. I'm not sure about nails. Okay. Uh, and then a couple questions about leave behinds. So um, for those of you um, who are saying you cannot find your leave behinds, they um, are actually in three places. The first place is they're on your calendar appointment uh, with your senator and or representatives. The second place you'll be able to find them is on the Excel events platform. If you go under resources, you will see a folder labeled leave behind. They are all there. If you're still having troubles finding them, um, feel free to reach out to us on chat here and we'll make sure to get you some sent over. Just make sure to provide your email address or email me personally and I'll make sure that you get them um, this afternoon. Uh, thirdly, there was an email that was should have been sent out to everybody uh, uh, mid last week, providing all of these leave behinds as well. So just double check your junk email folders. Um, let's the see. NIH and NCI, you have the yeah, numbers you there. Get those asked in. And those are, those are requests for, they can submit requests uh, to the subcommittee, Labor HHS, on those funding levels. Um, I have not seen, usually there are sign on letters in support of funding for NIH. Um, Cassie and I will look into that, but right now we can make the requests just that they support any effort to increase funding for NIH to that amount. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ed. And Kara, um, specifically, we're looking for 3.2 billion overall increase for the National Institutes of Health for fiscal 2022. Um, as well as uh, supporting 7.609 billion for the NI, uh, NCI, so the National Cancer Institutes. Um, and again, supporting the NIH's Office of Rare Disease and inclusion of melanoma language under the National Cancer Center Institute 
in the committee report accompanying the fiscal 2022 labor health and human services appropriations bill um, again we will make sure to get this uh, powerpoint um, once finished up in our resource center if possible um, and make sure that everyone has these powerpoints uh ed we have another question for you how do representatives versus senators support NIH, NCI, FDA, and the CDC? Do they support in the same way? And what is the melanoma specific language we are asking for? Okay, well, Nadia, that's in the lead behinds. It's also in my PowerPoint in terms of the melanoma specific language under NCI. Um, <clears throat> that, that, uh, and it's also in your lead behind. Uh, they support NIH, NCI, uh, the, and CDC in the Labor HHS Appropriations Bill by submitting those formal requests. And the uh, FDA is we, we're asking members or the offices to write the Food and Drug Administration, asking them to make fi to finalize the proposed rule. If you have in, any, if you have an office that's very interested. Uh, get back to Cassie and me, and we can write up a draft letter and uh, have that for them to send to the uh, Janet Woodcock, who's the acting uh, commissioner of FDA. Cassie, is that okay? I can't hear you. I, I'm muted and it's because it's mute Monday. It, it's happened since the start of the pandemic. So um, do you have any other information or any best practices you'd like to share before we move on to um, what it looks like to conduct a, a meeting? Well, the best practices we're leaving to you and trust me, if I want to augment whatever you say, I'm more than willing to do. That sounds perfect. So, so happy to have you on as part of that. Let me just put on back on my glasses so I can actually see my screen um, and go ahead and share my slides um, about um, this. Just give me one second here as I try to navigate this new virtual world. Um, and let me go through. All right, perfect. Let me just go ahead and make sure that I share this. Okay, and Ed, I'm just gonna ask you to mute real quick while I'm sharing this. Um, but again, welcome to the MR Advocacy Days. My name is Cassie Beisel. I am the Senior Advocacy Officer with the Melanoma Research Foundation. I've been with them since 2014. Um, and I am also an advanced melanoma survivor who was diagnosed in 2011 um, and, and uh, so far, so good, have benefited from a, a year long of interferon and a full removal of my lymph nodes. So thank you for joining me um, to talk about how to make the most of your meetings on the Hill. Um, and then in a little bit, I'll also discuss about your state caucus rooms and what to expect from those. So now I'm going to advance my own slides here and let's see if I can do that. Okay. So first of all, um, now that we have talked your ear off about um, the different policy asks for this year's event, uh, briefly just go over what advocacy is. Um, advocacy, for those of you who, who don't know, is an opportunity to educate others about an issue or cause that is important to you. Um, I would assume that everyone on here is, the cause is melanoma, um, and we are all here because we know somebody or have been directly impacted by this disease ourselves. So we're just part of the 1.3 million Americans who, who are living with the knowledge of melanoma through our own experiences. Um, advocacy begins with an issue or a cause um, and can continue through the legislative process until that idea becomes a law. Most of us have been advocates our entire lives and haven't realized it. So if you remember when you were young and your kids are probably some of the best advocates out there, um, constantly negotiating for a higher raise in, in a, and I almost said salary, but in a, a higher raise in allowance um, over the years um, by saying, this is what I do each week. You, you 
could support me, um, I can do more, um, and then you wind up giving them more money, they have successfully advocated. Um, so we can all learn a lesson from our children out there on what it means to be an advocate. Um, through advocacy, you can engage with elected officials and their staffs when um, they are in the process of making laws. Um, and as I mentioned before, we are now in the process of advocating very appropriations heavy because uh, appropriations, it's, it's technically the season on the Hill. Um, and this is the main thing that people are trying to get past now, um, especially with the president's budget coming out. Um, through advocacy, you can use your personal experiences and experiences of your family and those around you um, to collectively voice concerns to positively impact public policy. And, you know, this is again where I'm going to thank you all coming out here um, today to advocate on, on your behalf and the behalf of those who can't. Advocacy always works best in numbers. Um, as you've heard um, the message repeated several times a day, you are the constituent and, and your representatives care about what you have to say and your senators care about what you have to say as their constituent. They work for you. Your voice is important. Again, as advocates, your voice and actions are vital in delivering messages for those who can't. Your voice and actions can make a difference in shaping healthcare policy. We've seen it done every year here um, with the advocates who come constantly and share their voices and their stories. Um, as advocates, you have the ability to bring attention to an issue or a cause that may previously received little attention. Um, elected officials look for ways to better understand the issues that are important to their constituents and are open to hearing how the law and policies they help implement impact your constituents. So again, you can provide feedback um, about ways that the laws that they have passed or have failed to pass have really impacted your lives. And if we do so in a respectful manner, manner and we actually come with possible solutions to these issues, um, as you heard in um, with some of our, our state legislators that they're they're more prone to, to listen and work with you to help make those positive uh, changes uh, to benefit the community. Um, and again, it's your voice and actions that can help them do this. So if they don't hear from you, they're never going to know um, what is really impacting you as their constituent. Uh, so again, here's a really important message about communicating with Congress. When you're communicating with Congress, there's a few rules to remember, and we're going to go over the do's and don'ts in just one second. But briefly, um, always plan what you're going to say before your meeting. And again, that's why we're providing the areas for you and your advocates in those state breakout rooms um, that you'll be able to find when you go back into the lobby of Excel events. Um, to either chat via um, a, a text area or you can all join a video within there um, and you can talk about um, you know, who your leader is going to be um, for your group, group meetings, which will either be a group because you all share the same senator um, for the state or you share a similar district representative. Um, you're going to talk about who can deliver the message and make those requests. Um, you want to plan to get your message across in 15 to 30 minutes, no longer. Um, we do need to be respectful of the time of our representatives, senators, and their staffers. Um, you know, their schedules are, are very busy, as we heard. They're being pulled in multiple directions, um, and they want to listen to you, but honestly, they only have a few minutes to do so. So when we're going into these meetings, making sure that we're a well-organized functioning machine, if it's just you um, meeting or just two people, obviously you'll each have a little longer to share your stories, but we wanna make sure that everyone's story um, is able to be shared um, in an impactful way. Um, when you first walk in, um, a majority of you, um, I'll be in a few meetings, so I might not be somebody's constituent, but a majority of you are the constituent of that office. So establish that from the very beginning. Hi, my name is Joe Smith. Um, I live in your district, um, and you can even thank them for some of the previous work they've done um, that you support from them. Um, you want to introduce the staff to the MRF. So I'm a constituent of yours. I'm also an advocate for the Melanoma Research Foundation, um, and this is why I'm here, which brings us to the next step, which is telling your story and your personal experience or that of a family member or friend with melanoma. Um, before you actually bring your story in, you want to present 
the uh, MRF's legislative requests. Come in, um, look at your leave behind at the meeting, you know, let them know I'm here to talk about defense-funded melanoma research, an increase in funding for the NIH and NCI, talk about the FDA's ban um, or reintroducing or finalizing that 2016 proposed rules, the ban scanning um, devices, um, and, and then providing any of those leave behind materials um, to them, uh, which has actually already been done by our amazing Aretha um, Robinson over at Van Scoyok Associates. So thank you so much. She has um, attached all of those to your meeting request, but again, um, they are all over our sites and in our resources as well. And if you somehow still can't get them, just let us know and we'll send you a copy. Um, and then again, be very specific in requesting actions by the congressional offices and within your meetings. So don't leave anything ambiguous out there. And we'll review this again in the do's and don'ts. You wanna make sure that you follow up and say, again, this is what I am asking for. And do you feel that your office can support it? Or what do you believe the congressman or woman's take would be on this? Do you feel that they would support this? Um, and then, as Ed always says, follow up is a chariot of genius. Um, so follow up with them after your meeting with an email to the staff and to the, the, the member of Congress. Um, include the background materials, again, those leave behinds, um, and ask whether or not the representative or senator um, has signed on to the letter or will sign on to the letter. Um, and Ed's got his hand raised. Well, and also, follow up with Cassie or Cassie and me, or Cassie will follow up with me, whatever feedback you get from that office, so that uh, if there's specific information or specific to do, uh, we can provide more detailed answers. And we can, for example, I can fill out their appropriations forms, et cetera. Exactly, and that's a really great point, Ed. Um, and though for you, those of you have, who haven't met before, we do ask um, to let us know, and you'll be provided feedback forms for your meetings as well. Um, those will be sent to you in a link. It's connected to a Survey Monkey, but it's really great to keep track of those meetings um, and let us know either way uh, what the result is of those asks are. That way, Ed and I can go ahead and follow up to ensure that uh, we get the most signatures possible needed. Um, so that brings us again to the do's or don'ts, and I've already went over a few of them, but there are do's and don'ts within these meetings. Um, so the question is to do or not to do. So the do's of lobbying, and I uh, apologize that um, the, uh, let me go back here, sorry about that, my screen. Let's see, okay. Here we go, the do's of lobbying, and apologize for that little typo right there. Um, since this is going to be a virtual um, meeting, um, make sure that you keep yourself muted when you are not speaking. Um, there is, um, I, most of you have had the Teams training. If there's any um, issue or anyone doesn't know where to find that mute button, um, just let us know. We'll make sure we can send a screenshot with a little circle around it to show you where the, the Microsoft Teams mute button is. Um, you want to make sure that you resolve any technical difficulties prior to the meeting. Um, so again, if you haven't watched that Microsoft Teams training, please make sure that you watch it. It's in our resource section on our Excel event platforms, which is what we're on right now. Um, obviously, before you start talking, you want to make sure that the staffer and or legislator is on the call. Um, you want to make sure that you make the staffer and legislator feel welcome. Thank you so much for your time. We know that you're busy. Um, we really are grateful for you being here today. This means so much to us. Um, and then tell your story and relate it to the ask. So we're asking for $40 million in defense-funded research. You know what? You know, share your own story about melanoma and that, you know, maybe you aren't in the service, but you sure can imagine how those folks who get diagnosed in the military feel because of your own personal experience. Um, and that melanoma rates keep going up, and that is that is a point for um, concern. Um, so, again, you want to clearly state your ask with no ambiguity. 
re-ask in a yes no format okay do will your will the representative be signing on to carolyn maloney's letter will you do you think that the representative will be able to sign on to carolyn maloney's letter um and so make sure that you get that clear concise answer and then let ed and i know so we can certainly follow up them directly after um then of course um, everybody should request contact information to follow up um, so uh, it's, it's not unheard of to ask them to send you um, an email. Normally we ask for business cards these days, uh, but since we're not in person, you can certainly ask for the information there, ask that they write their information in the chat area on Microsoft Teams, that way everyone can record it. Ed, did you have a raised hand or? No, okay. And then lastly, um, and certainly not least, again, thank the staffer for their time and or the legislator. You cannot thank anybody um, enough. Um, we'd rather think more than less. Um, they are very busy, um, even though it is their job to meet with their constituents. Um, it's still something we're very thankful for and we're grateful just for them to listen. Yeah, I, actually, I do have two points. Yeah, one, um, keep it, Don't no more than 30 minutes, 20 to 25 would be best. Uh, I found that a number of staff do not do these Zoom or Teams or whatever they're called. They they will they will um, enter through phone, uh, which I think there should be a, a phone line hookup as well. Cassie, is that correct? So correct. Uh, you know, so just be prepared. Don't don't be uh, put off by it. Just they feel more comfortable that. Uh, and in terms of uh, email, if you're talking to a house staff and the person's name is mine, Edward Long, uh, and then the house, it's edward.long at mail.house.gov. And if it's a Senate staff, let's say it's Edward Long working for Diane Feinstein, uh, it's edward underscore long at feinstein.senate.gov. Those are two different ways. So if you're, if you're at a loss for what the email is, that's a general rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. That's a real Really great point, Ed. And we can certainly, um, I believe we sent out the link on how to look up your legislator, but we can certainly send out the link to advocates again, so you can easily look them up um, and all of their email and contact info will also be right there as well. And if for some reason you cannot find it, just please reach out, uh, us, reach out to us over at the MRF and we'll be happy to help you look up that information. Um, I also wanna say another do that's not on here, um, but if you are in group meetings, do be respectful of the time of your storytelling. Everyone's story here is very important and we know how excited and important it is for you to, to get your story out and, and make sure that you provide all the details which brought you here today. But there, at times there could be four other people within that meeting that do need to tell their story as well. So just please be very mindful and respectful of time and make sure that you're sharing that time within the group. Um, and again, you'll have time after this to, to connect with your group and, and work out what that exactly means. Um, so now onto the don'ts of lobbying. So um, when you go into this meeting, um, make sure that you do not have any background distractions such as pets, um, you know, young ch children, unless they're part of this meeting, um, then that's absolutely fine. But we want to make sure to keep distractions at a, at a minimum in order to make the most of your time there. Again, um, you know, many meetings will go 15 to 30 minutes. And so we have to stay very on track. Our ask has to be very intentional and our stories need to be very precise, um, yet still very personable. Um, this, is a, this is a big one. Please do not show up late to your meetings if for some reason, um, and this year the good news is no one has to run across um, the congressional lawn from the House side to the Senate side, so this saves some time. But if you are running late, um, please reach out and let Aretha know, um, Aretha Robinson with Van Scoia Associates, who was so kind to set up your meetings earlier. Um, that way she can reach out to the office and let them know that you're going to be late or for any reason if someone gets sick, please let us know as soon as possible. That way we can make accommodations for that and let the, the congressional office know. Um, so my rule of thumb, five minutes early is on time. Um, 
please do not be disrespectful. Um, I have met a majority of you here and none of you have ever been disrespectful, but just please make sure that we, we give time for them to respond to our questions, um, our thoughts, what we're saying, um, that we don't interrupt or talk over them or anyone else within the meeting. Um, and, and that we're not pushing them back into a corner. Um, so we, we, we want to be respectful, um, whether they, whether the congressional staff or the legislative staff um, push back a little bit um, doesn't mean that it's okay for us to push back too much at them. We want to make sure that we're respectful of everything that we say and do, even if you don't always agree. So we have to be very bipartisan in these meetings as well. Um, you want to make sure that you, if you're a constituent of that person's office, that you know it. So if you're unsure, again, we'll put a link in, in the chat box. Um, I believe um, it's it's uh, congress.gov or something of the sorts where you can look up to make sure that they're, they're in your district um, and or that they are indeed your state um, senator. Um, we want to make sure that we're not reading our personal devices. So if you're in a meeting other than looking at notes, um, which is totally acceptable, and I have to do it um, a lot because I have massive chemo brain and don't remember everything, um, but we want to make sure we're not sending texts to family members or anyone else um, while in the meeting that we're paying full attention to what's happening. Um, and um, don't do what I do, which is ramble, um, as I'm probably doing right now, but we want to make sure that we're staying concise and, again, to the point. Um, and last and certainly not least, again, that we're not stating anything negative and that we're being um, as positive as possible within this call. Ed, yes, your hand is up. Yes. Uh, don't take phone calls while you're on a phone call, while you're on the call or the Zoom call, that would be very disrespectful and not appreciative. Uh, two, um, if you've given money to a particular candidate, don't raise it. That's illegal. Um, that's, a, that, that's, that's a campaign issue, not a policy issue. And uh, don't be, don't get into a fight. Um, you know, uh, you're asking, remember you're asking assistance from a staff um, you know, so if they say they can't sign on, uh, be respectful, make your point, and then provide any additional information as need be, um, or get back to Cassie or me and we can try to answer some questions. Uh, but th this is not a partisan exercise. I know, you know, it's hard not to say that uh, things aren't, you know, very polarized in Washington. Just look what happened in January 6th. But uh, we're, this is a bipartisan, nonpartisan request. Skin cancer, melanoma affects people, Democrat and Republican alike. And our message is quite clear about getting, we want bipartisan, we need bipartisan support. And we've had bipartisan support. Great. Thank you, Ed. And let's see. Um, now, real quick, I'll review your state caucus breakouts, and I'll make sure that I save some time because I know there's some questions in the chat here. So I'll go through this as quickly as possible. Um, otherwise, this event will completely cut me off and the screen will go black. So um, I guess that's one of the things of virtual meetings. Um, but you'll basically, when you're going in there, and this is just a guide to help you with your team roles to ensure that timing um, is set up and everyone gets a chance. So we recommend that when you, uh, after this meeting, you're going to again break out into your state caucus groups, um, and that will be um, on the left hand side of your um, of your screen. You'll be able to see where it says lobby, um, breakout rooms, etc. Um, so um, we recommend that you Hello? assign a team leader. Um, and the team leader will really ensure the meeting flows as planned. Um, they keep track of time and they help to direct some of the other participants. Um, a team leader, I would recommend if you have several people in your meeting to choose a team lead who has done this before and is comfortable making the asks, um, unless you're like really brave and you want to see how you do your first shot around. Um, then that's absolutely fine. But again, it's recommended that we do have somebody who's keeping track of that time. 
Um, there's also an impact storyteller position um, and that person and or persons describes their melanoma um, experience on a personal level. Um, you can provide a short anecdote related to the ask um, and obviously preferably a constituent of that legislator. Um, where, but I don't think there's many meetings where um, folks attending are not that constituent. Um, the asker clearly makes the ask again, um, you know, will the Congresswoman support Carolyn Maloney's letter for 40 million in defense funded melanoma research? Um, and again, the asker can ensure there is no ambiguity in that ask by asking that very straightforward yes or no question again right there. And then I recommend that we have somebody there that uh, takes notes or a scribe. Um, so taking notes will help make sure that um, anything that was talked about can be reviewed later on. Um, and we want to make sure that we capture all the important ideas covered. Um, that way, if there's something that needs to be followed up by Ed or myself, we can absolutely do that or that needs to be followed up personally by any members in the group that is in the meetings. Um, this person would also be responsible to sending notes um, to the entire team if there were several people on your call sending notes to them after the meeting or um, connecting afterwards to do brief on what happened there, um, which again you can do through in the state caucus rooms um, until Wednesday, I think about 5 p.m. Eastern time is when that kind of shuts off. Um, so again, a meeting structure, you're going to walk in, you're going to say thanks. Um, we generally like to have the team leader go in at first and say, you know, thank you for your time. Um, the team leader will then facilitate introductions to the rest of the team, including name, hometown, and relation to melanoma. Um, again, the team lead will preview the ask. So in the past, when this was in person, this person would have the packet of leave behind handed to them and say, we would like to discuss defense funded melanoma research today, as well as the FDA 2016 proposed rule on um, tanning devices um, or whatever it is that you're going to ask. And again, after that ask, then the team lead will help to say, you know, um, we're first up, we're going to have Rose, Amy, and Bob uh, share their stories. Each one will have, you know, each one will give their stories in about three to five minutes, um, but how melanoma has impacted them. And again, if you can direct that impact back to the ask, um, we highly recommend that you do it. And um, again, just like you can never thank someone too much, um, you can never reinstate the ask too much. Maybe you can, if they've already answered, they will or they won't, but again, Remember to make um, to get a clear yes or no, whether it's from the congressperson or their staffer um, in, in the realms of will the representative support 40 million in defense funded melanoma research um, and then bring that back to Ed and I and let us know. Um, and then uh, the meeting structure continued again, we're going to conclude the team leader thanks the staffer or legislator for their time. Um, the note taker requests contact information and informs them um, that they will be in touch. Um, again, make sure um, more that most of them can write their contact information in the team's notes if they are on the team's platform. If not, ask them to spell it out for you if they're on the phone um, and the note taker or everyone who is available to take notes, please write that down. Ask myself or any of the MRF staff if you have questions um, finding their contact information will be more than happy to help you get it. Um, post meeting, the note taker, as we said, will send the key notes from the meeting to the rest of the team and sends thank you letters to the staffer. I say no to this and I wanna revise it a little bit because the post meeting, the note taker sends key notes from the meeting to the rest of the team and all of the meeting attendees will send a thank you letter to the legislator and their staff thanking them for their time. Again, you're, you're, you're building a relationship with your lawmaker um, and we wanna make sure that we're following um, certain guidelines. That way you can continue to have a very beneficial active relationship um, with your either the staff member or the, the Congresswoman or man um, representing your district and or state. Um, and then before I take questions, I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow, Tuesday, March 2nd, um, you will not be joining here first thing in the morning unless you and your group are meeting on those state caucus asks. But we ask that you join us back 
at 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Um, I'm sorry, and that's supposed to say specific time for Advocate Open the Mic Night, where advocates will share their stories and experiences um, and, and you know, um, everyone can kind of listen in and, and, you know, we can find things in common with one another. Um, now I'm going to take off my glasses so I can actually read some of these questions here though. Um, let's see. Let me go back up. There's several questions. Um, thank you. Uh, one question is none if none of our representatives are on the committees that Ed listed, will we still have opportunities to meet with legislators from their state and their staff? And Ed, my answer to this is yes, um, just because somebody is not on your house committee or subcommittee or on the Senate committees um, doesn't mean that you can't ask for their support for things like defense funding research or um, NCI or NIH funding. Ed, do you have anything to add for that? Uh, yeah, because somehow I lost the image here. Can you hear me, Cassie? I can still hear you, yes. Okay, can't see me. Uh, the, you know, in fact, members are, who are off the committee or not on the committee can actually sign on to the letter. Carolyn Maloney is not on appropriations, not on labor H, not on defense. So. Um, uh, and in fact, if you have a member who is on appropriations, they probably won't sign the Maloney letter. Uh, so you have a different ask, like you have to ask them to, you know, su submit that on a personal one-on-one -on -one level with their, with the chair around our senators who are not on those committees. So don't worry about that. Okay, and I'm sorry about that technical difficulty we just had with the screen. Um, let's see, the next question is, I just want to also reiterate to everybody, there's been some questions that um, the email address to the people you're going to be meeting with are in your meeting request as well, so you can always grab their address that way. Um, and Kara, we've already answered that for you. Um, okay, so here's a great question from Michelle. What should we do if our congressperson has not responded to the meeting request? Well, how do you, I mean, can you hear me? Cassie, it, yes, can you they, hear me? They've, res, they've responded because if they, if you're having a meeting with them, the staff has responded. Uh, and if you're not, then, um, then we, you're not going to have a meeting because you can't <laughs> call them up uh, on their own or you can't walk by their offices now, now that we're all virtual. Yeah, and, and if there is an issue, if you get on the meeting and no one has joined, please reach out to myself and Aretha Robinson, who, who scheduled your meetings, so we can figure out what's going on. However, if you didn't see them accept, doesn't mean that they didn't accept. A lot of times people um, do not respond or, or choose to show their response of accepting. So, um, you know, just make sure um, that if nobody shows up or you are you have a real um, nervousness if they're going to be on just reach out to us and we can try to help you um, as much as we can um, uh, the, again here's another question will you be giving us a list of email contact info for each team member again that's going to be within your meeting um, uh, areas so um, that will be on your teams area and I think I hit all questions right now. I want to make sure, does anyone else have any other questions before I go? Okay, and if not, um, again, we're going to be meeting um, the state caucus rooms after this will open up at 2.15. Um, you will be able to find them um, in the Excel events platform, which we are on right now. If you just go to the lobby, you'll see where the breakout rooms are. Um, and you will be given time there for the next hour to be able to review your information with folks. Um, I know uh, we do have some people asking for a list of who signed on to Maloney's letter last year. We are working um, to um, get that out to everybody. So we'll email that letter. I believe there was about 26 sign-ons the first pass around and 23 the second time it had to go back to the house um, for approval, um, and 
let's see, there's another question here. Uh, if you're not a, if, so I have a question here about um, being not a constituent for your other meetings. That's okay that you are not, you're there representing those who could not represent right now. So just please feel free to share your story, any knowledge you have of those states, and you let them know that you are not a constituent, but again, that you're here on behalf of those who could not attend in that specific state. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers that. Um, and so with that, um, I want to make sure that, um, that uh, sorry, I'm just making sure there's no other questions that uh, everyone is comfortable going to their state caucus rooms. I will be popping in and out of a few of those as well. Um, you will see me popping in and out of your meetings throughout the week as well. Again, meetings are going uh, Tuesday, and Friday, uh, and once those are over, you will get an email from us closing out. Don't forget to join us back here tomorrow at 4 p.m. for open mic night for our advocates, as well as um, making sure that, um, that uh, you are back here on Wednesday night for a congressional town hall with Carolyn Maloney, um, and um, she'll be talking to us about what's going to be happening and what it's going to look like in Congress uh, for the 117th um, Congress. And with that, thank you all so much for being here. At 2.15, please do not forget to join your state room. Um, that way you can work with your other members, uh, other advocates from that state to work on your ass to practice your storytelling. And we are here, if you have any questions, please email us. I will be on the chat for the next hour as well um, if there's any questions that I can answer outside of this. Uh, and with that, thank you so much. We appreciate you all coming here and we look forward to seeing you more later throughout the week. Thank you so much.